Well, thank you, Eugene. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, at, here at Twitter uh, and uh, at Scale by the Bay together, which uh, Alexi was right. I never did uh, the two together. I was often at Twitter, and I think once at Scale by the Bay, but never, never together. OK, so I'm going to tell you, uh, I, I'm going to give a new talk uh, today. And I'm going to tell you in this talk about some of the new functional constructs that are probably going to make it in Scala 3. And with functional mean, I mean, well, they help functional programming and they work really well. So I mean functional in, in both senses of the word. So uh, Scala 3, what is that? If, in case you haven't heard yet, uh, so there's a plan. We have a plan. There's a roadmap um, uh, f that has been out for a while to say, well, we are now at uh, Scala 2.12. Uh, Scala 2.13 is coming out shortly in January, uh, slated in January. Uh, what's coming afterwards? And uh, what's coming afterwards will be essentially a big step. It will be Scala 3.0. Uh, so there will be a parallel development. Scala 2.13 will, uh, after uh, 2.13, there will be 2.14. And the purpose of 2.14 is really to smooth the migration to uh, 3.0. So what will happen is that there will already be some joint components. The first of these is the new collections, which are also going to be in 2.13 and which we will take in 3.0. Uh, the next thing is the tasty middle end. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, 2.14 will otherwise, essentially, the purpose of 2.14 is to put in the necessary things in place to make the migration to 3.0 easier. And 3.0 is both a logical step in the evolution of Scala. And to some degrees, it's also a pretty new language, a fresh version of the language. Uh, and today, it's my pleasure to tell you a bit more about that. So why, okay. why, why Scala 3? Uh, well, to ask that, it's maybe better to go back to the roots and ask, why Scala? So what's the point of Scala? So for me, the uh, importance uh, why Scala exists is really that it's a fusion of object-oriented and functional programming in a tight setting. And it, I believe it was the first mainstream language to have achieved that. And why that's important is that I believe that functions and generally functional programming is a very natural way to express the logic of your program and a very safe way to express the logic of your program. Uh, on the other hand, objects can be seen as a very powerful module system. Module systems, well, people tell you components are good, modularity is good, but if you look at what's actually out there, what you have, then most languages don't give you a lot of means to express components and modules. But object-oriented languages do. And the, essentially the trick that Scala did was to say, well, we want to sort of drop from object-oriented languages all the craft which says objects need to have state and identity and all this stuff and just concentrate on the modularity aspects of objects. And that led to, for instance, innovations like that objects could have type members, uh, which uh, they don't have in traditional object-oriented languages, but they do have in modular languages such as ML. So that's the purpose of Scala. So, and you could say that it was a big success. Well, I'm talking here at Twitter, so obviously uh, that's one of the signs of, of a big success of Scala. But more generally, I mean, here's a list of language features, and they all now look pretty much common, right? Closures, yeah, sure, function types, uh, expression-orientated language, no statements, tuples, local type inference, pattern matching by name parameters, x colon t syntax, dependent types, and so on. So all of these are essentially features where you say, yeah, makes sense. Uh, it's pretty standard by now. But actually, I would claim that Scala was the first language that introduced any one of these features in the setting that I'm talking about, in a setting of a mainstream language with object-oriented features. So Scala was first for every one of them. And a lot of other languages have followed suite, which is great. Imitation is the best form of flattery. So uh, languages that have followed sweet are C Sharp, that was the first one in, in a lot of things, and also other languages such as Kotlin, Swift, and also Java. Java is getting more of Java's features in each new release. That doesn't make Java a functional language, by the way. Uh, I think Java can uh, get a lot of uh, functional features like pattern matching and uh, and lambdas, but as long as Java has a separation between statements and, and expressions, it's not a functional language. Think about it. Even something as simple as an if-then-else or a try or a, or a switch, they're all statements. That means that 
To execute them, they have to mutate a variable, otherwise a statement wouldn't do anything. So if your basic building blocks only work by mutating variables, how can you claim to be a functional language? You can't. So that's basically the, the, the thing that even though other languages can accumulate a lot of features, I, don't, I think they miss the point of functional programming here. Cool. So after this uh, 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 thing to say, well, why not rest on our laurels? Uh, why, why not stop here? Uh, we did it. Uh, lots of the industry is following suit. Uh, I could retire now, right? Um, so, well, I don't want to retire. So, and I think that I've learned, and generally we as a community have learned quite a bit over the 15 years of Scala usage. And it's time to essentially apply what we learned in uh, a language where if we know by now where things could work better, let's do it. Let's do a big jump and essentially apply what we learned. So what could we do? Well, one thing is, over the last 15 years, usage patterns have evolved. When we started, basically, the standard was object-oriented programming, and essentially every little bit that we gave people in functional programming was like a big innovation, and people were puzzled, what is this new thing? Now functional programming is pretty standard, and it turned out that some of the things that people do, uh, I mentioned, uh, algebraic data types or type classes or things like that are in Scala, let's face it, a bit clunky. It wasn't, there was no primitive syntax for it. It wasn't designed for that. We were happy in the first version of Scala that you could encode these things. But the more people use a common pattern, the more you want uh, essentially a concise way to express these things. And part of the thing, the features I'm, I'm going to show you is about that. Uh, the other thing is that Scala was a language that was designed for bas basically extensibility. So uh, everything could be expressed as a library construct. You could have DSLs. Uh, so it was a very, or still is, a very unopinionated language. You can write Scala in any style you like because the constructs of Scala are very, very general and they compose in very general ways. And sometimes over the 15 years we have noted that there are certain things that we've learned and that uh, some in particular newcomers fall into where we would now classify them as traps. So one of these things to be concrete is overuse of implicit conversions. So uh, that's some of the things where we say, well, we need to become, we want to become now more opinionated. We have essentially all the data to say, well, what is good Scala style? Let's give more guidance to programmers to actually write in that style. Uh, in the same way, we of course want to avoid puzzlers and pitfalls. I love the Scala Puzzles book. Uh, I really enjoy reading that, but uh, of course I make it my, my ambition to uh, eradicate as many of those, and I'm sure that if we do that, they will find others, but uh, let's, let's keep up the work. Um, one thing that we can do now, we, we, we didn't have first was foundations. So over the uh, in, uh, 2008 to 2012 about, we developed uh, a, a calculus called dot, dependent object types, which is essentially now taken as the basis of what Scala is. There are a bunch of papers, uh, there are proofs that this thing is sound, uh, that these things make sense. And that gives us a very good guidance to essentially say for any language features that we have, do they make sense or don't they make sense? For types, that's very important. The types really tell you something about your program, not something, something that is essentially uh, true for the final value of the program. So these proofs that types are correct, they, they're honest, they're called type soundness uh, theorems, and we have a type soundness theorem for dot, and we can apply it essentially as a design guideline to, full, to the full language. And finally, to bring out the simplicity of the language, because I really believe that Scala at its heart is a simple language. And I think I'm proven by, by several things. First, that I think a lot of kids like to start with Scala. Uh, the, the other thing is we had a lot of success with our online courses. By now, there's more than a million people who have actually learned functional programming with Scala. And you couldn't do that if Scala was a very complicated language. So imagine Scala was like C, C++, that would be a very frustrating experience. I think that that's what I really want to concentrate on to say Scala is fundamentally a simple language. It allows to do, it lets, it allows you to do complex things with it, which is natural and is, is, is good. But you shouldn't essentially uh, uh, confuse the basis with the things that you can do with it. Okay, so that's it. I just want to hear, I can't tell you about all the language that would take all day. So I, I want to essentially concentrate today on new features. So what is, what is new? What are sort of the more uh, exciting and important new features? And I want to essentially 
uh, just concentrate on those fours. Uh, I talked about implicit function types a bit before, but the other three I never talked about. Those are enums, uh, extension methods, and opaque types. So let's see what they are. So let's start with enums. So an enum, uh, at first glance, is an enumeration. Uh, Scala didn't have enumerations. It had this enumeration cl class, which was uh, almost universally hated by people. Uh, and uh, everybody wanted essentially true Java enumerations. So uh, now, now we have them. Uh, so here's a simple enumeration. That's what you write it, enum color. Case red, green, blue. So that's the three cases of the enumeration. And that gives you essentially values color.red. Uh, and uh, you have uh, uh, operations on these, like you can find out what its ordinal value is and things like that. So that's a very simple case of uh, an enumeration. Uh, you can uh, make them Java compatible by extending Java lang enum. So if your enumeration extends Java lang enum, then it actually will be compiled as a Java enumeration and will be visible from Java as an enumeration. So that closes this interoperability problem where up to now we have to say, well, if we need an enumeration that's understandable from both Scala and Java, we have to write it as a Java, Java class. You can't write it in Scala. So now you can write it in Scala. Um, so here's that, that example also shows that essentially you can uh, have more complex enumerations than just the three color values. So enumerations can have parameters, uh, like here, mass, and they can have uh, um, private, um, uh, well, they can have members, like a private field here, and uh, two uh, public methods. Uh, so, and the cases of an enumeration, they then essentially pass the parameters here in, uh, to, the, to the base trait. That's, again, pretty similar of the way Java does it. In fact, this example is taken from the, from the standard Java documentation of enumerations. So I just wanted to show you that, yes, you can express these things in Scala as well. Good, so that was the number one thing. But uh, enums are actually more general than enumerations. They also let you do algebraic data types, uh, the uh, abbreviated to ADTs. And also the generalized version, GADTs, generalized algebraic data types. So here's an example of an ADT. Uh, option, the option uh, that you all know. So option, you have, uh, uh, how, how do you model that? Well, you have a trait, sealed trait, and uh, a case class, uh, sum, and a case object, none, and they extend option, op option with the right parameters, right? So now there's a more concise way to write that. So here's uh, what you can write, write now. You just say enum option, uh, uh, it has a covariant parameter, type parameter t, and then you have two cases, sum, which takes an x of type t, and none, uh, which uh, is the, the option without anything. Uh, you can, uh, as usual, add methods to an option. So you can methods to the option itself, but not to the cases. The cases, cases are just data. Uh, so any method that you have in the option goes, applies to the whole option class. So here, for instance, is a class, is the option defined? Uh, where you could uh, then do a pattern match on the two cases that you have. And you can have a companion object for your type. So here in this companion object, you have the usual apply method for uh, options, which says, well, if it's null, then you get none, and otherwise you get sum of x. So this essentially gives you the analog of essentially a case class hierarchy. And it's something that I think programmers write uh, as a matter of course in Scala, but they write it quite often. There are a huge number of case classes out there in sealed traits. So uh, having ADTs in your basic syntax makes that easier. You don't need to write all these classes anymore. Uh, you just write the sim simple ADT. Uh, here's another one. Uh, so uh, result, so uh, a nicer version, version of either. Uh, with OK and error values. Uh, so what's interesting here is that here, uh, the two values, OK and error, they both have explicit extends classes. Because in, o in each case, one of the two type parameters becomes nothing. So for the OK case, well, you say that's a result of t, and the error field is nothing. And in the error value, you say that's a result of nothing, and the error is essentially this uh, of the type here, uh, this, this e here. Uh, so the usage is as usual, you write result.ok and result.error. So why have we chosen to put the cases inside the companion object? You have to prefix it. 
But the reason is, uh, if you do that, then you can always pull them out if you want with an import, right? You can always write import result dot underscore and then you get them. Whereas if we had them defined them in the global namespace, essentially there's no way to squeeze the toothbrush toothpaste back into the tube, right? So once they're in the global namespace, they're out there and you can't have the other choice. So that's why we had the more conservative choice to put them in the companion object. Okay, so uh, you can also have uh, uh, generalized algebraic data types, GADTs. So the difference with a ADT and a GADT is that a GADT extends the base class at a specific type. So for, in, for, for instance, here you have an enum uh, tree, uh, which is essentially a, an expression tree, uh, an abstract syntax tree, and T is essentially the type of the expressions. So you say, well, here are some cases for this tree. So true, you say that's a tree, an expression of type Boolean, and so is false. And zero is a tree of type int, and the successor takes the tree of type int and gives you a tree of type int, and so on. And finally, you have the if statement, which <coughs> is a tree of type boolean and two subtrees, both of type t, and it gives you a type t. So the way you get a GADT is give an explicit extends class uh, and essentially tell you in what way it extends, at, at what parameters it extends your base class. Here you have only one case which is actually parametric, which means it's ex it extends the base tree at exactly the same parameter, and that is if. So for if, um, sorry, uh, for if uh, the extend, <coughs> extends clause here could be added, and would just read extends tree of t, because that's, that's, that's what an if is. Okay. So, here, so here's a function for these uh, that works on these trees, the evaluation function. It says, well, it takes a tree of t and it gives you a tree uh, at, at t. So that just goes through all the cases, and uh, in each case it will actually work out what, what the right value is. So you say here, if it's a true, then it gives you true. If it's a uh, is zero, then it uh, essentially evaluates the value f here and asks whether it's zero and so on. So the importance is this all works without type casts, and that's basically the idea of these generalized algebraic data types and pattern matching for them that it makes that work. Good. Uh, another interesting thing is, so you say now with the same construct, you can actually have ADTs, GADTs, and enums. Uh, can you mix them? Well, there are actually hybrids. Well, you could say uh, the tree was a hybrid. Uh, the, there were some uh, direct uh, cases and others were indirect. You could, could even argue enum result. Is that an ADT or a GADT? Strictly speaking, it's a GADT, but you could say, well, because it's nothing here, it's still essentially, it's still not, not a specific use case. Uh, nothing on a covariant thing sort of encompasses all possible uses. But what you can also do is you can mix enumerations and ADTs, and that shows why it makes sense to use the same construct for both. So here you have an, a new version of your uh, color class, which now has an RGB argument. And it says, well, we have red, green, and blue, which essentially give you the standard RGB values for that. And then we have another case mix, where essentially you just give the RGB value directly and that extends color of mix. So that's strictly speaking not an enumeration because it has this third case, but those three first cases, they look a lot like an enumeration. <coughs> so essentially in the, in the Scala solution, they, uh, they, you have a, they, it's fluid. You can go from enumeration and ADTs because we don't distinguish the two. So one interesting thing to look at is what would this translate to? So what it would translate to is a sealed trait color course for the base class. Then uh, for this one here you would have a case class and I should say for enums all case classes that are generated are final. So no, no more this business that you can inherit from case classes. Enum, enum case classes are final. By, uh, so that would be the mix class that extends color in the way it's indicated here. And then you would have three objects, three instances, red, green and blue. They share a single anonymous class that also extends color. So one, so one thing that we have with these enums is if you have a lot of values, simple values which are not parameterized, then you don't create a new object or a new class, a new class uh, value for each of them. They all share basically the same implementation and that means you can have large enumerations without generating a lot of code. Good. So why add enums? Uh, well, the main principal reason really is convenience. Uh, 
uh, as I showed in the, in the example, they don't really add uh, essential functionality. You had a question? Yeah, I was wondering what their corresponding integer values, I think they're called ordinal values, and I'm not sure, of the mix would be, because usually in three durations you have integer values corresponding to Yeah. Right? So what would the... So the, the, uh, the, or, you mean the ordinal value of these things, the yeah. integer value? Uh, do you, you have, uh, I think they would all have the same. So uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, you, you just essentially per case, even if it's parameterized, you have a value. Okay. Yeah. It, the values really only make sense for simple cases, which are not parameterized. OK. So um, like I said, enums are uh, mostly for convenience. Uh, an ADT can be translated to sealed traits and case classes or case objects. And simple enum values are translated to objects of a common class. So why add them? Well, uh, it's less boilerplate than al algebraic data types. And uh, at least for simple enums, none of the existing solutions was really satisfactory uh, in particular. None of them solve Java interoperability and these things. So enums really give you basically this, that, that missing piece of the puzzle. OK. Status of enums is uh, they emerged, so they're in the current implementation. The Java interop still needs to be implemented, and we have started to discuss them, but generally, I believe people are favorable to add them. Uh, the second thing uh, I want to talk about is extension methods, and that's uh, a fairly, fairly new addition. So uh, an example of extension methods is this, this one here. So let's say you have a class circle uh, with coordinates and a radius and you want to add an operation circumference, which you want to call like, like this, circle.circumference. Uh, so the way you can do that is you can write uh, circumference as an extension method. Uh, it's declared as an extension method by using this as a modifier for essentially its first parameter. So circumference says, well, it takes a C, which is a circle, and this is marked as a this parameter, and it gives you a double, and then it essentially has the usual formula. And furthermore, you put this circumference in an implicit object. I'll explain later why, why, why you want to do that. And if you do this, then essentially you can just write it circle dot circumference, no, no matter where you are. Uh, you don't have to import this extension method specifically. The fact that's in this companion object and that that object is implicit is good enough. So that means you can use it everywhere. And uh, uh, extension methods are not magic, they're essentially just syntactic sugar for this thing here, where you say, well, an extension method really translates to essentially the circle ops object, and then you call the circumference method and you pass the circle as a parameter. So you can use both calling syntaxes, but the one with the uh, dot here is, of course, more convenient. OK, so the visibility of extension, so, so far, you say, well, that's C-sharp. C-sharp has exactly the same notion of extension methods. But here's the one new thing, and that has to do with the visibility of extension methods. So there are two possibilities. An, an extension method can be used if it's defined or imported in scope. That's what C-sharp does. Or an extension method is a member of an implicit value that's in scope. And that's, that's a new one. So that's what we have used before. So for instance, if we write here a uh, implicit object string seek obs, uh, which ha has a thing that it takes a sequence of strings and it gives you essentially the sequence of longest strings in that. So all strings that have the that are con collectively have the longest length of all the strings in the sequence, uh, then you could use it uh, like like this wherever uh, you 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 are, because essentially uh, the implicit scope of list looks for the sequence. So if this is essentially defined co together with sequence, then you get it with the, as the implicit object. OK, so why is this important? So it's important because it works really well with type classes. So here's uh, an example of your, your standard example of type classes, uh, semigroup and monoid. Uh, so that's sort of the first thing you always start with. So semigroup, you say, uh, is a trait. Uh, it has a combined method, and you want to use it in fix, so you make it an extension method. And monoid is a semigroup that has a unit value. OK. And uh, monoid has uh, the supply method. I'm getting to that. Uh, and then you want to say you want to define an implementation. So let's say strings are monoids. 
And you can do that by just defining an implicit object string monoid, which is a monoid of string. And you say, well, I need to implement those two operations. So here's combine. It's just concatenation. And here's unit. That's just the empty string, right? Um, and now I want to have something which is generic over all uh, monoids. So I did want to define a sum <coughs> method which says if type T is a monoid, then essentially sum up the uh, elements of, list of the given list of T, sum up all the elements. OK, so we, we start here to say sum of T context bound monoid. So T must be a monoid. Take a list of T, give, give me back a T. So that's a fold left of the unit of the monoid instance of T. So that goes to this apply method here. And then the operation of the fold left is the combine operation here. OK, so why does that work? I mean, combine is an extension method. Normally, you would say you have to import that from somewhere. That would be really bad to import it because, hey, you don't know which combine you want. It's a, it's a general T. The, the, the T is a monoid. Uh, but we say, well, as long as you have a monoid instance in scope, an instance of this guy here, but a semigroup instance, because that's where it's co combine is defined, a combine is available as an extension method. Okay. So do we have an instance of semigroup or monoid in scope? Yes, of course, we do. There's a context-bound monoid. So that gives you an implicit parameter of type monoid of t in, indirectly, right? And that parameter is, of course, in scope. So I, I have a monoid of t, so I can apply combine like this. So that's essentially just a simple twist how we com can combine type class syntax in infix operations, which was missing up to now. So that essentially caused infinite worries of, of people and a lot of creative solutions like uh, Simulacrum, which is a fairly complicated macro library that adds all sorts of magic imports to your program to make this work. But it turns out with that simple twist, you don't need that anymore. It just works out of the box uh, like what you want to do. Does it work on higher kind of types? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's do the standard higher kind of type example. So we have a functor here. Uh, a map function, so a map now would say, well, it's an infix operation, of course. It takes a this, which is of type f of a, where f is the functor, and a function from a to b, and gives you an f of b. And then a monad is a functor, and it has, besides map, a flat map and a pure. So a flat map is like map, only that it essentially takes a function of a from a to f of b, and it gives you an f of b. And if you have pure and flat map, you can actually define map already like this at this level. So a map is then just a flat map where I apply the f that gives me an f of b, and then essentially I call pure on the rest. OK, and then uh, I can have essentially an, the usual implementation of, let's say, a list monad for these things. OK, so all of this works sort of out of the box and, and very nicely. So it actually turns out that to get type classes, Scala already had basically everything in place. There was just this little twist to say, well, we didn't, it didn't really work very well with infix methods. Now, if, now we have a notion of extension methods that works very, really well with that. And I think we can, we can say, OK, now really normal traits are uh, type classes, and implicit objects are instances of type classes. And that's the end of the story. So why extension methods? Well, yes? I, how does, what does this mean if there is no implicit? So if I just write object blah, 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 this, is it just, uh, does it mean anything in that Yes. So uh, then the method is still an extension method if you import it or you have it in scope somehow. Then you can use it, yeah. So basically, you have this choice. You either import it, that's sort of the standard way that you know from C Sharp as well, or other languages with extension methods. Or that's a new thing. If it's part of an implicit object that you have in scope, then it applies as well. OK, so why extension methods then? Well, they give you a lightweight and natural way to get infix syntax for operations. There are no wrappers, and there's no boxing. So you don't essentially have to essentially create wrapper objects to then call a method. So they translate into essentially direct binary method calls. Uh, you can define a single method instead of a binary method and an infix forwarder in an implicit class. And that's what essentially makes the type class examples work so smoothly. Status, uh, so that's uh, still an open pull request. Uh, 
People like it generally, uh, and I think the, exp the, the discussion has pretty much essentially come to a conclusion that uh, yes, that seems to be a good way, good way to do it. There don't seem to be many more uh, change requests for that. So I would expect that to be merged relatively soon. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is opaque types. So opaque types, um, or opaque type aliases, I should say, give you type abstraction without any overhead. So here's an example. Uh, let's say we want to have a type for logarithms. Um, and of course, a logarithm value, that's a double. Uh, but uh, I want to have operations that are specific for, mo for logarithms. So if I, if I write type logarithm is equals double, that's just a type alias. But if I prefix that with the opaque modifier, then I get a, a new type. So logarithm is a type completely different from double, uh, which is implemented as a double, but it's, it's different. And furthermore, the fact that logarithm equals double is only known in the companion object of logarithm. So let's have a look at that. So generally, if I use logarithm, then it's a new type. It's different from double. But if I'm in the companion object, so we, I, I am in the object next to it, which has the same name, then I know that logarithm equals double. And that's why I um, can, uh, for instance, define an apply method that essentially create, gives me a logarithm of essentially uh, a number. And that returns a logarithm. And here I can write math.log d. So math.log d gives me a double, of course. And here I claim to return a logarithm, but that's OK because inside the companion object, I know that they're the same thing. So I can do that. And I can give you other operations as well, such as uh, exponent to give you uh, uh, the, back the double from a logarithm. Or I can give you one of these extension method objects. Uh, that's the ops object where I now in introduce two double plus and star as operations directly on logarithm using our syntax of extension methods here. So the plus method would take a logarithm and a logarithm, and it would essentially, what it would do is it essentially takes the exponent of x and y and takes the logarithm of that. OK, so if you do that, then uh, you have essentially a safe way to use these logarithms. So essentially, you can multiply them. You can add logarithms. And these are essentially all safe operations because you have defined them in the companion object. What you can't do is you can't do anything else. So you can't assign a double with a logarithm or a logarithm with a double. You can't take logarithm times 2 because 2 is not a logarithm. It's, a, it's an int which can be widened to a double. And you can't do L divided by L2. You can't divide two logarithms because there's no operation for division in this companion object. OK. So one really nice application of opaque types uh, is immutable arrays. So opaque types Im enable immutable arrays. Um, and uh, here's a way that can be done. So we can now define a type opaque type i array for immutable array. And that's the same thing as array of a. OK, and then what operations do we add to i array? So they, again, go into the implicit object. Well, we would have lengths, like for a normal array, and apply, so indexing, like, like for a normal array, but no update, so because the array is immutable. So essentially, we take lengths and apply from the normal arrays, and we drop update. And here's the definition. Uh, there's nothing much, nothing very, very uh, amazing about it. So we take an immutable array, and we cast it to an array because, hey, we know it's the same thing, we, so we can do that. And we just forward to the same operations on, array, uh, on the normal array, length and i. And that means we can now have uh, a uh, usage like this. We can create an immutable array. We take its length, and uh, we index it. But we can't change any elements of it. OK, so why is that important? I think it will, be, will enable lots of really good, good things. Uh, the problem of a language like Scala that operates in, on the JVM and has to interoperate with Java is really that there's a tension of having a functional language in an imperative environment. And for that reason, arrays are, of course, sort of the 
dominant, ubiquitous, simple collection, most performant collection that you have on the JVM. But in, ja in Scala, we don't use them much because they're mutable, so they're dirty. So we, 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 we shun them and we want to essentially have higher level operations like immutable sequences. And maybe uh, sometimes they map to arrays. In the end, everything maps to arrays, but there are layers and layers on top of them. So that's a problem because it actually introduces a performance overhead. These things are not as fast as they could be. And it's also a problem because you can't interoperate with Java very well because Java uses essentially immutable, immutable arrays for these things. So with immutable arrays, sort of we break the tension and say, no, actually, we can embrace arrays. Arrays are good because we don't essentially, we can take away the capability to update them. So we can essentially have these things safely. And I think that, in the end, will, will make a, a lot of things work, work much, much better. Yes? Uh, for opaque types, do they also hide the uh, overriding or the type class instances for their overriding types? Yes, they hide the type class instances, yeah, yeah. They're really treated as, outside the companion object, they're treated as two completely different types. <laughs> okay. So one discussion that we had, so opaque types have been introduced uh, already a while ago, more than a year ago, uh, I think by Eric Ossheim and uh, Jorge Cantero, uh, and have been made a SIP, uh, uh, Scala Improvement Proposal, and it was sort of uh, lingering for a while, and we went through many, many uh, redesigns. The first uh, design was really a version of value classes. So you could ask, well, since we have value classes, why, why opaque types? Because after all, there are, there are overlaps between the two. So both of them introduce a new type, and both of them avoid boxing in some cases. So the main difference is only opaque types guarantee to never box. Value classes don't box if you're in a monomorphic context so you know exactly what class you have, but when you go generic, they have to box. And because you, they guarantee to never box, you can do things like immutable arrays, where it's very important that you say, no matter what happens, I need to have the underlying representation of a Java array, not a wrapper of a Java array, because otherwise I can't interrupt. So that's, I think, is very important. The other downside of value classes is that the boxing model is sometimes hard to follow. So for instance, value class instances have to be boxed if they're stored in a collection or in an array if they're passed to a function value or returned from it, and if they're elements of a tuple. In all these cases, basically, we, we lose the monomorphic context and we have to uh, box the value class. And that might be surprising for some of you who didn't expect that, who, who thought that, well, value classes, they should not box in all cases, but unfortunately, there are many cases where they have to box. So value classes can, uh, on the other hand, only value classes can customize two string. So seconds 12 can print as 12 seconds, and only value classes allow type tests. So if we compare them, then I said, well, given opaque types, actually value classes have only very limited usefulness. Like giving a two string and type tests, like that somehow doesn't feel to, to, to justify a feature in a, in a language. Uh, and so we could drop them. We could drop them, but except for that value classes are in the works for possibly a future version of Java. That's a project Valhalla that would bring back value classes, but in a, in a sort of more powerful form where value classes are sort of general structs that can have many values, but that avoid boxing. So if Valhalla comes up with that, we want that. That's a very useful uh, construct, but as long as the JVM doesn't support it, we, there's nothing we can do about it. So if project Valhalla comes to fruition, then that would give us a clear separation. We say, for assembling multiple fields in a struct without boxing, use a value class. For hiding the representation of a single type, use opaque types, because only opaque types guarantee no boxing in all cases. So for that reason, value classes, I would call them currently parked. So they're not deprecated. They will not be deprecated. They will stay around. But we would sort of encourage all existing usages to consider opaque types as essentially a more, more solid and more performant alternative. OK, status op op of opaque types is also merged and under discussion already for a while by the SIP committee, who is generally in favor. Um, since I'm almost out of time, I will skip implicit function types. Uh, I've talked about implicit function types before, uh, so I will uh, do a quick thing. But I do want to do the last example here, because it's cute and it brings it, it ties together 
uh, several, several things. So here's an example that ties together extension methods, opaque types, and implicit function types. So what I want to do is, do you know about insuring? Who has used insuring already? It's, OK, a couple of you. So it's in the standard library. It's sort of in the uh, contract thing. It's like assert and require and insuring. So assert is just an assert. You write require is an assert where you essentially want something from an argument. And insuring is essentially an assert where you state something about a function result. So you use it like this. So list of one, two, three, sum dot insuring result equals six. Only right now you don't use it like this because you can't talk about the result like this. You'd have to pass a lambda, which says lambda result, result equals six. And that's kind of annoying, right? I mean, you should, you should say, well, in an insuring result means the result of the functions. Can we somehow wire up things that this works? And furthermore, I want to wire up things so that this works as basically no cost. So this thing should not cost more than just essentially taking the result uh, having a single assert and returning the result in three statements. OK, so here's how we can do this. So um, we uh, would have uh, an infix method. Ensuring is an infix method, so make it an extension of uh, method. Implicit object ensuring. Uh, it takes a, a t of arbitrary t, and it takes a condition. And that condition is now an implicit function from wrapped result of t to Boolean. And what it would do is, is essentially it wraps the x in this type, wrapped result, asserts the condition, and returns the x. Why does it? So this looks law, sort of like our expansions, but why does it wrap the result? Well, it wraps the result because the result type is actually an implicit. And uh, implicits want very specific types, otherwise you get ambiguities and you don't know what happens. So having a generic type parameter t as an implicit is a terrible idea. So what we want is essentially a very specific thing to say, well, this is the result type. So that now when we have the result method that we can use in this thing, well, the result method just says, well, I need a wrapped result of t, and I just tell you what it is. I unwrap it and give you the value. So that's how I can get at the result. OK, so the wrapped result implicit here is basically so that I can have a specific type that means results. But I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to box it. So I don't want to, now the idea is I don't need to do that because it's an opaque type. Wrapped result of t is t. And here's my wrap and my unwrap method. So I can back and forth. But in the end, all these things will compile away. I mean, it's, it's just a type alias. So the advantage here, it's absolutely zero overhead. So if I have, um, uh, after some trivial inlining, my uh, insuring thing would look like this. And if I do some more inlining, then, uh, oh, sorry. Oh. then the result goes away, because after all, result of an implicit re uh, evidence of a, a result is just ER, so it's just the identity. So that goes away. And uh, finally, I have to look at, uh, I can look at the insuring. Well, that's a really simple method as well. So I can inline that, and I get what I started with. So I get, essentially, I do the sum of x, a list one of 1, 2, 3, sum, assert x equals 6, and return. OK, so I will skip ahead, because I, I'm seriously out of time, it seems. Status of implicit function types, it's merged and approved in principle by the subcommittee. Um, I just want to say, quickly finish to talk about, essentially, where we are with respect of tooling. So we have a new compiler, uh, rich IDE support. Uh, we have a REPL uh, and a doc tool. And all the tooling is built around Tasty. So Tasty is um, a uh, typed abstract syntax trees, which is a new serialization format for Scala. So it gives you complete position and type information. Uh, all the implicits are made explicit. So basically, it just tells you in exact, in great detail, what's essentially in uh, your source uh, and, uh, and in, in how the compiler sees your source. Uh, the challenge <coughs> is to make it compact, because once you do that, uh, my initial thing was uh, this will surely be at least 10 times bigger than source once we store all this information. It, it actually, we worked very hard to make it compact, so the end result is it's about the same size of source. And that makes it perfectly acceptable, I think, as, as essentially your standard format. So the, the, Scala, the, the Scala 3 compiler will essentially produce a full tasty tree for every uh, file it compiles. And that thing then can be used for many, many different things. So 
Here's what it's used for currently. So we have the new Scala compiler. It generates the tasty, and from the tasty, it generates class files, Java 8 class files. It also reads the tasty for, for different compilation units. If you have separate compilation, then the compiler needs to find out what's in this other compilation unit, and it consults the tasty for that. We have a proof of concept for uh, Scala 2 uh, to do the same thing. So that's currently in proof of concept stage, has to be worked on. Uh, but uh, the idea is that Scala, Scala 2 will do the same thing. It will produce the same tasty and uh, read the things from the same format. Uh, why is that important? Because that means that we will be able to freely mix modules written in Scala 2 and Scala 3. They have the same uh, intermediate format. They can essentially both read what's, what's in each other things and we can, we can compile Scala 2 and Scala 3 together. The other thing usage for tasty is, is for the IDE. Uh, where we use uh, LSP, uh, the uh, language server protocol, to actually implement a, an IDE for VS Code and I think for some other editors as well. And LSP essentially lets us consult what's in the program. So you can use it, for instance, for find references and things like that. Okay, now the vision is that this thing will also be the central engine on which you put macros, analyzers, optimizers, Essentially, all of that will work on that format. Why is that good? Well, because it's standardized. It means that, uh, think of Tasty sort of like the Scala bytecode. We won't change it from one year to the next. We will very, very carefully evolve it, and we will we commit to not breaking anything. So in the future, I think, uh, I, I, I guess every one of you has already faced uh, the binary compatibility problems of some sort or another. I think in the future, that's an answer for it, because you say, well, for Tasty, Tasty will be kept stable. So that means that also if you have artifacts, like uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your, your modules, if you distribute them, then uh, Tasty is the one thing that can be kept stable and that then essentially can map into essentially whatever backend you have, uh, whatever is the latest Java version or also to JavaScript, or also to, uh, to, to native. And furthermore, it's also a possibility then to say, well, if I uh, essentially need to upgrade to a new format, I can essentially recompile my versions directly without, without essentially invoking the front-end compiler. I'm, the idea is that all, all of this would be integrated in the build tools that would do it automatically. Cool, so migration. Uh, so lots of new features, but how do we get there? Uh, so um, I think that it's actually, well, the, the people are sometimes scared and say Scala 2, Scala 3, how is that gonna be better than Python 2 and Python 3? That didn't work out so well. Uh, <laughs> So, so hopefully we thought very hard about that, um, but I think we have a couple of things in our favor, uh, and those are specifically static typing and binary compatibility. So static typing, because for us, essentially any incompatibility, it's a type checker that will catch you out. Uh, you won't see these errors in, at runtime by production failing because you, uh, your, your tests went were incomplete in some way. So there's much less fear to upgrade if you have a strong static type system than a dynamic typing thing. And the other is the binary compatibility, which is enabled by the Tasty. So already today, we can have Dotty modules, which is like the current project name for Scala 3, use Scala 2 modules. Well, for instance, our uh, compiler uses the Scala 2 standard library. We haven't recompiled that. That's just the 2.12 standard library. So we can do that. But in the future with Tasty, we can actually do much more. So we can start with that, and then we can have maybe a new foundation library that somebody thought it's cool, already wrote in Scala 3. It can still be used from Scala 2, because essentially uh, both use the same interchange format, the Tasty, and therefore they're compatible. So that means you will be able to migrate whatever modules you have at the speed that you think is appropriate without having to look at any dependencies. The dependencies can be Scala 2 or Scala 3, it doesn't matter, and likewise for your clients. So timeline, uh, it's very ambitious. Uh, so what we want, uh, we're currently in the phase where we flesh out the design, get feedback, do refinements, and we have releases to support that. They are, um, come under the name .e0.x, so right now we're .e0.11. Every six weeks we have a new one. Uh, in uh, about mid-2019, we want to go into feature freeze. That means no new features. Uh, everything so far is essentially fleshed out uh, and implemented. And then we want to take a year for stabilization. So stabilization will mean uh, 
uh, write the specs, uh, get the docs out, write uh, the port library modules to use the new features, uh, work on uh, getting out the bugs, uh, getting more tests and things like that. So, so that would put a release then one year later in mid-2020. So that's the plan for it. Uh, we need help for that, so it would be great if you could already start porting libraries and report back what you want, and maybe also join the team. Lausanne is a nice place, and we're actually looking currently for compiler engineers to help us in that task. So there's much more to discover uh, if you want to find out more. So there's a dirty documentation uh, that I can't get to because I don't seem to. Ah, yeah, I do. I can get to. Um, um, and... Uh, if you have questions or remarks, I'm here all day today and uh, sometime tomorrow as well. Uh, please let, let me know and let us know what you think. Thank you.